I think we would all agree that we want our children to grow up to be articulate, literate, and numerate. But following on from the last speakers, I wonder what else we need our children to learn to create a truly sustainable future. Four years ago, I was fortunate enough to go to Antarctica. Not great on carbon footprint, but an extraordinary learning experience nonetheless. And I went to Antarctica to set up an education base run on renewable energy. With the simple message, if you can do it there, you can do it anywhere. During my time in Antarctica, I learned three things. The first was the power of silence in deepening our understanding. I wonder in our busy, noisy, fast-moving world, how much time we give to our young people to value and appreciate silence in deepening their understanding of what they're doing and where they're going. The second thing I appreciated in Antarctica was that penguins really can fly <laughs> at lightning speed through the wa their water world, that they're perfectly adapted to that environment, and they're part of a very resilient but also very fragile ecosystem. And the final thing I learned apart from the cold, was that Antarctica, and on the peninsula in particular, the climate is really changing. The most recent evidence tells us that in the last 50 years, Antarctica on the peninsula has warmed by six degrees centigrade. So, I returned home, and I had two options. Either to close my eyes, ignore the problem, and do nothing, quite tempting when it's like that, or to work with governors, staff, uh, parents, and most importantly, children, to create some positive change. I think the traditional model of teaching is still that. Teachers standing at the front, talking probably too much, children listening attentively, and if you look very closely, yes, one or two of them are beginning to nod off. So, we needed to look at a different way of doing things. Energy in school is managed by the site manager or the bursar. But we needed to run a project where our children led and managed our energy. So, we asked them to rise to the carbon challenge. We asked them to audit where we consume energy and how much we consume. And we asked them to start to question the status quo and to change what's normal. That's good, sustainable thinking. So we used an energy monitoring system, and we made our energy monitoring very high profile. I think it's all very well having a green day or a theme environmental week, but actually this kind of practice needs to be sustained long term if it's going to have any kind of real impact. So we embedded energy monitoring into our data handling in maths, and our children started to get a different sense of what data handling was all about. It wasn't a photocopied worksheet. It was real live data that they could change. That's very motivating. We also look to enlighten our practice, to bring literally natural light into our school and flood our buildings with this good natural light. So we put solar tubes into our corridors, we put Velux windows into our cloakrooms, we put a big light dome into our hall. It's changed the practice a lot. Renewable energy is becoming, I think, an increasing option. We funded, worked hard to fund a lot of renewable energy technology, and that technology is starting to have an impact on our children. The other day, a child of six years old came to me with a playground design and said, I've designed a slide, it's south-facing, it has solar PV panels all the way down the front, and those panels create the energy for a water fountain. That's brilliant thinking at six years old. Most importantly, with this technology and with their thinking and their monitoring, we needed to reward their success. Money is a motivator in this, so that's what we did. We asked our oldest children to analyze our data each week. In the winter months, it was 100 kilowatt hours a day, about 10 pounds for a school, and in the summer, less. And the children in assembly on a Friday, an achievers assembly, 
listen to the scores, and if they're below the target, one, two, three, four, five days, Mr. Dunn, have I got one? Gives them 10 pounds. Not each. <laughs> Collectively. So they earn some money for doing good things, reducing carbon and saving us energy. Over the last three years or so, we've reduced our electricity consumption by over 80% and saved several thousand pounds in the process. So from energy and how much can we reduce, we went to food and food growing. We wanted our children to see how low can we go in energy terms and how much can we grow in food. We've heard earlier about connection. Part of that process was to really connect our children to the land, to the soil. We wanted them to go from seeing food as packaged in a supermarket to being something that they can plant as a seed and to nurture. In the background, you can see a gardener. We've recently employed him on a part-time basis. And I wonder in our communities how many people with great wisdom and great expertise can work with us in education to help our children really connect back to the land and where food really comes from. Our year four children are eight and nine years old. On Friday, they launched their business. It's called the Eco Turtle Business, the Eco Turtle Project. And it's very simple. They gave every family a free bottle of cleaning product, multi-purpose antibacterial or bathroom cleaner. And they had a simple message. You take your bottle, you get a squirt of concentrate, you fill it up with water, it costs you 50p. It's good for the environment because it's plant-based. It's good for your pocket, and it's good for us, because we make a little bit of profit on any, every squirt, and we can use that to put plants into our school. That's very powerful. When you want to see children's eyes shine, get them to start running their own business. <laughs> okay, I am aware this boy at the front looks like a terrorist. He's actually a spider, and he's performing in an ugly bug ball performance. In year two, they learn about mini beasts and they learn about local biodiversity. But actually, in sustainable terms, that's not enough. They need to know those two things and they also need to know what can enhance and improve that local biodiversity and then they need to do it. So those children have had a powerful learning experience through local biodiversity. And last term, they did a project on local community. The teacher asked them, what do you want to do in your community to make a difference? Children always surprise you. They said, there's a wall around the corner from our school. It's a low-level wall. It's all falling apart. We need to repair it. So they contacted a number of people. They sent letters. They were on the phone, recording each other with films on the phone. And it wasn't going anywhere. So one morning, one of the boys in the class, his name's Ian Volkov, he's a Russian. He came to the door, he said, Mr. Dan, I'd like to use your phone. Fine, come in. So he came in, sat down at my desk, he said, uh, it's okay, I have the number. <laughs> Picked up the phone and dialed the number. Local authority. Ah, oh, good morning, my name is Ian Volkov, I'm from Ashley Primary School. Uh, we're not happy about the wall in Walton. The woman listened very carefully to what he had to say. And then she said, I can't help you directly, but I can give you the number of the property company who own that land. He said, one moment, please. Uh, Mr. Dunn, a pen. <laughs> I passed him a pen. He said, I'm ready for, for the name of the company. He took the name down, put the phone down. And I said to him, what are you going to do next? He said, tomorrow morning, Mr. Dunn, I will have the number of the company, and I will phone them. He phoned them in the next, the next day, and within a week, that wall, which parents, to be honest, have been complaining to me about for, a, for the previous 18 months, that wall had gone. That's a change maker, age six years old. Very, very powerful learning experience. On Monday, we take our year sixes on a new leaders in sustainability expedition to Chamonix by train. It's the culmination of all their learning on sustainability, and they learn about it in terms of individual sustainability and well-being, 
What do we need as individuals to be well? If we don't get that right, the bigger picture doesn't matter. What does team or community well-being mean? And most importantly, what does global well-being mean in a local context? We can't change our world, but we can change where we are. Through that experience, that global context, or locally applied, they spend time with the Chamonix Valley Sustainability Team, and they design together the 30-year development plan for that valley. Chamonix, with its glaciers, is changing very dramatically through climate change. So they're actually developing and working on a design process with those people. We need to make the story theirs. Hand over the leadership to them and see what they can do. So let me conclude with a quote from the American John Shah. The future is not some place we're going to, but one we're creating. The paths to it are not found, but made. And most importantly, the making of those pathways changes both the maker and the destination. If we want to create a truly sustainable future, we need to develop visionary young leaders for that future now. And education, in partnership with many others, is going to be critical to making that happen. Thank you very much.